Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with the America Israel Friendship League. My name is Naomi Reinhartz. I am calling in from New York, and I am the Chief Development Officer of AFL. I am personally very excited. I'm a big music fan of Israeli music, and I'm um, really delighted to be sharing with you today's webinar of the Jerusalem Orchestra. We have some wonderful guests that I will introduce you to in a moment, as well as some great music to listen to for the next hour. And for all of our mothers out there, I wanna wish you a very, very happy Mother's Day. And for all the children out there, I hope you have something wonderful planned for your mothers, um, whether in person or virtual. I know last year, um, a lot of us miss seeing our moms in person and hopefully this year we can spend more time in person. And happy Mother's Day to my mom out there who's watching from Boston. Um, so I would love everyone to share in the chat where you are calling in from. Um, I know we always have people calling in from around the world. Um, so please let us know and also let us know what you're doing today to celebrate your moms out there. Um, so I am first delighted to introduce our first panelist, Buni Kochavi. Um, he has served as the Consul for Cultural Affairs in North America at the Consulate General of Israel in New York since October 2019. He has also served um, in other places around the world, from Amman, Jordan, to London, UK, to Washington, DC. Um, we also have Tom Cohen, um, who um, at only 38, um, has um, been the founder, arranger, and head conductor, and musical director of the Jerusalem Orchestra, East and West, um, for the past 11 seasons. It celebrated its last, um, last November, its 11th season. And we have Matthew Nickel, um, who is a composer, arranger, pianist, and educator based in Boston, who has composed music for TV, radio, film, um, and has released um, his own original music um, through numerous albums. So let me first turn it over to Booney, uh, who will share with us some greetings from New York. Good afternoon and happy Mother Day. Uh, on behalf of the Consulate General of Israel in New York, I'm happy to take part in this event and would like to thank the AIFL team for a successful partnership with us. I also want to thank uh, Rene Schreiber, our dedicated and creative director of performing arts and music for her hard work that made this event happen. It's the desert, Mother Earth is in bright colors under the burning sun and a pink podium with a young conductor full of vision and ready with his button to begin. And then he starts to dance, surrounded by the members of his orchestra to the sounds of music that combine the East with the West, the North with the South, the desert with the forest and the fields. Featuring Munir Bashir and Guy Mintus, David Broza and Bedouin Love Song, the, Jer the Jerusalem Orchestra East-West is a musical startup playing for us from the startup nation in the words of Tom Cohen, its founder and conductor. This event is an opportunity to celebrate this unique Israeli orchestra and to meet its visionary entrepreneur who teaches us how vision, creativity, and perfection create exciting music that sounds familiar, but yet is totally new. Israel was thriving cultural and artistic startup nation long before the high-tech buzz as is evident in the Ramon School of Music with its long musical and education partnership with the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts, and with Tom and his orchestra. They are a successful ambassadors of the endless creativity of the Israeli cultural scene. So let me once again thank AIFL for hosting this event, and I'm looking forward for continuing our successful partnership. And thank you all for participant in this event. Thanks. Thank you very much, Booney. And um, let me now turn it over to Tom Cohen in Israel, who will share with us a little bit about himself and what we have in store for us today. Well, first of all, I must uh, correct you. I'm not, I'm not currently in Israel. Soon, soon, soon. Tomorrow I'll be in Israel. <laughs> I'm in Brussels, um, as you can I understand from the fact that I'm wearing a, a long sleeve jacket. 
Um, I would like to take the opportunity just before the start to thank really our dear friends, uh, both Booni and Rene uh, from the embassy that have made this collaboration possible and, and uh, are doing so. It's, it's always fun to meet people that are working out of a real motivated place and okay. always, and obviously for your kind words, I, I mean, I, I, I blushed a bit. And to my good friend, uh, uh, Matthew, for, for taking the time out of his uh, very precious time and, and, and being with us uh, today. Um, today we'll, we'll try to present uh, with the short time that we have to talk and present about the music that this orchestra does, the Jerusalem Orchestra East and West, and the, and the new language, new musical language that we are uh, uh, trying to uh, to compose, to create, to, to a music that, that basically is built on, on the fact that in places like Jerusalem, for example, all the traditions of the world, Western tradition, Eastern tradition, traditions of Arab countries and European countries and North American countries, all come together, not as visitors or bypasses, but as, as uh, they are rooted in the sound of the ground, if you will, of the place. Uh, uh, a good uh, example for that and for our uh, plan or hope or vision or, or uh, uh, aspire, or what we are aspiring to do uh, is to create, to be a part of the new sound of the Middle East now with all of the new uh, and positive changes that are happening within the area. We would like to be a positive force. We, we would like to remember that uh, the Cold War between the US and Russia finished with a, a group of uh, ping pong players traveling uh, and, and we would like to take our privileges as artists, as artists and, and take and zoom out and don't look at the last few decades of wars that we had, but look at rather a, a more a wide picture of years of creating together culture and music. And the first song that we'll hear is actually an example exactly for that. It's a, a song that was, uh, uh, the, the process of it, it was initiated when the, we, we were surprised one day to wake up in the morning and hey, here we now have peace with the uh, United Arab Emirates and with the Kingdom of Bahrain. And the first thing that I uh, did was I took the phone and I called an American singer, a good friend of mine called Rechela, that, uh, that basically all of her career, she has a, She's a different uh, a webinar completely, but she has a very interesting story. Basically, her career is in, at the Gulf uh, uh, region. She performed in Saudi Arabia, in the Emirates, in Bahrain. And uh, I asked her to make the contact for us. There's peace now. We can suddenly talk to each other. And, and we actually moved faster than the, real, than the reality because by the time that... Uh, uh, an amazing poet uh, uh, by, by, by the name of Ahmed bin Idris and an amazing composer by the name of uh, uh, Muhammad Hussein uh, composed and wrote this song for us. We got it back to Israel. We recorded all the orchestra in my arrangement, playing it. We sent it to Bahrain where they recorded the choir and the percussions. And then Rechela came and put her crystal voice on top of all of that. And, and actually, the, the, the funny story about that is that we did all of this, and then when we wanted to pay the studio in Bahrain, we discovered that there is still no way to transfer money from Israel to Bahrain. So I had to do it from my personal account here in Brussels, so we can find... <laughs> so, but, but that's just, just, just some uh, uh, details. Uh, I think you can all enjoy the, the new sound of the Middle East, as we would like to see it. This is a song called Hasbi in Arabic, meaning feel me.
Wow. That was, that was amazing. Was that, was that filmed in the Negev or where, where was that? No, that, that, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, second of all, that was filmed in Midbar Yehuda, in the Judea <laughs> desert, uh, uh, like 45 minutes uh, from Jerusalem. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and just so you know, we're getting so many comments in the chat, a lot of people loving it already. And yes, this is being recorded. Yes, this will be available to you afterwards on YouTube at our website, and we will share this with you. So no worries if you missed the beginning or if you um, want to see it again. Um, and we'll talk more about that at the end. So um, thank you for that, that first piece. Let me turn it over to Matthew. Um, I'd love to hear your perspectives on the importance of the East meets West um, encounters of, of music um, these days. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think what's so interesting about what Tom is doing is that it's really bringing an important sound into the West. And when we say the West, of course, that's kind of a colonial term, the East and the West. What I would say is we focus on what's happening in the United States. We have a lot of Africa in the United States. And to borrow a term from flamenco, from flamenco, we'd say Ido Vuelta, you know, the music that's come and gone back to Africa, but it's also come back to us. So we have all the wonderful music from the African diaspora that comes to the United States primarily through South America and Cuba. And of course, then it goes back and hits Africa and comes back to us in another form. Um, so we have a lot of Africa, particularly um, music of the diaspora. We don't have a lot of music from what we might call the East, from what Tom's calling the Middle East. What I would say is if we think of the rim of the Mediterranean, which unfortunately in a lot of US geography classes, they cut off um, halfway through the Mediterranean. So you see Europe up there, you see a little bit of Egypt and a little bit of Israel over there, but it's mostly just the European countries. And we forget that there's a lower rim to that. So the rim, of the Mediterranean is such a rich place in musical tradition. And in fact, it had a tremendous impact in uh, the music of Andalusia and all those places like that. So we don't have a lot of contact, or let me, let me put it this way. It is growing the influence of that region on our, on our culture. But if you look at music education in the United States, and uh, I'm at Berkeley College of Music, we have literally hundreds of ensembles and classes that deal with music from the African diaspora. We have maybe 25 or 30 music uh, classes in music from the Middle East. So there's a, such a rich and wonderful tradition there, the Arabic tradition, music from Iran, music from Israel, music from the Balkan states that has been neglected, um, but is now uh, through efforts like Tom's orchestra, now it's coming into our culture in a much more vibrant way. And uh, maybe later we can talk a little bit about why uh, the music from Latin America and Cuba was so successful in, its, uh, in the way it came to the US and become so pervasive in our culture, technically how that happened. I'd like to ask Tom a little bit how he might see that happening with music from the Middle East, but those are some more technical questions we might get to later. But that's sort of my summary of where where I see things and why I think the music that Tom is working with is so important uh, to us in America. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Tom, um, going off of that, I mean, a lot of these musical traditions are quite old, right, in the region. And how do these uh, musical traditions retain their authenticity and their history, but also move forward in the present to today's um, modern um, style of music? Well, basically, the idea, that's a very good question, and I will try to answer it without becoming, without being too technical uh, about it. But uh, it's a very good question because we are dealing with uh, very rich traditions that have a very strong uh, and clear, uh, aesthetic way to, to present them and to play them and to preserve them. And if you want to touch them, uh, if you want to be allowed to do that and be respect, respected and respectful for doing that or by doing that, uh, um, you need to know them very, very well be before you can start uh, uh, making this fusion, which is another word, like Matthew already mentioned, the East and West. So fusion is another word that we can put together with the East and West in the, in the box of, of words that we don't like and still use a lot. Uh, I, I think that the idea is really 
to, to know very well uh, uh, the traditions first. And when you understand if, you know, Matthew was very humble now speaking about what I do, but in, the, in, in Berkeley, they have, uh, uh, Matthew is the head of the uh, Mediterranean Music Institute, where they facilitate this, the creation of this new language in two ways. First of all, musically, because they have great talents that are studying their, some of the, of the best voices in Arabic music today, to mention, for example, Leif Siddiq, a boy that a boy, an amazing violinist that I happen to know since he was 12, uh, but 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 is is really a, a one of a kind uh, violinist. And so so first of all, they meet all these great musicians together that know the the that know their tradition very very well and other traditions. And the moment a violinist like like uh, uh, Leif Siddiq uh, 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 that comes from a very uh, uh, strong. Arabic tradition on one hand and, and classical Western tradition on the other hand, comes to Boston and studies jazz there, he has enough knowledge, but profound knowledge, to create this new style of music because he understands where the traditions meet and where they separate. And this is basically what I'm trying to do in my work for the last decade minimum. <laughs> I've been aware of doing this for the last decade. I, I think I've been doing it for more. I must say that the second thing which I must praise uh, Matthew and the, and the Mediterranean Music Institute for is that by is facilitating it not only musically, but also, how should I put it? I don't want to say politically, but the people that cannot meet in our region sometimes have to travel all the way to the other side of the globe to Boston where they can just play music together and be friends and learn from each other and influence each other. And, and I think if you, if you allow me, I'll do, I'll do this like a, a, like, a, like a TV host. I'll do this transition to the next song <laughs> that, uh, that we are about to play because actually it has to do exactly with this that we're talking about. Uh, during the, 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 the harsh uh, uh, beginning of the corona pandemic, when we were all frightened that the world has ended and we cannot leave the house and we don't know what to do anymore and how it will move on from here, I had this strange feeling. I felt light suddenly. First of all, I was with my family. On the personal level, I was with my family, which is something that I didn't get a chance to do that much and so deep and for so long and, for, and with with so relaxed for, for many years, for since I remember myself. But besides that, suddenly I've noticed that because I cannot see my neighbors from the next city here, it doesn't matter if I'm talking via Zoom, via phone, via whatever, with people that I, are my friends from Brussels or from Israel, or with people from uh, Morocco, for example, or Egypt, or, or friends of mine, or colleagues around the world. And this was exactly the idea of the next song that we'll hear. It's, it's a song called Wayak, meaning with you, uh, by the legendary uh, Egyptian composer Farid al-Atrash. Uh, which for me, coming from a family that is half uh, uh, Mizrahi, half Ashkenazi, was my, the soundtrack of my childhood in many ways. I don't feel that this is, it, uh, I, and I don't mean to be provocative by this, I don't feel that Farid al is less Israeli music than uh, Nomi Shemer, for example, because this was the soundtrack of my childhood in my neighborhood where I grew up in Beersheba. And playing Farid al Atrash with my orchestra that were recorded all by their cellular phones. Imagine that, I conducted at home on nothing, with no music. I was just doing this and giving the signs to everybody. I sent them the scores. Each one recorded only his part with his phone, watching me on the screen playing to his phone, to the camera of the phone, his thing. We mixed it all and then we sent it to Sana Marhati, as an amazing singer that I worked a lot with from Morocco, a big, a big star in Morocco that was game enough to, to play, sing to her phone this song that she likes very much. And there you go, in a period where nobody can leave the house, we created this triangle of a Moroccan diva playing with an orchestra from Jerusalem, a song of a legendary Egyptian composer, and all of that just using our phones and, and our will to create a new style or, or to, I, I will not say, I, 
creating a new style, it is not a revolution, it's rather an evolution, continuing this, this uh, style that we appreciate and love so much. Beautiful, thank you. Let's, thank you. let's see the clip. Three and... We don't, we don't usually see the conductor, you know, as part of the musical ensemble, you know, from the front, we usually see him from behind and far away. So it was cool to see your, your facial uh, reactions to the, to the music. Thank you very, very much. The funny thing, actually you cut out the last, the, if, I, I'm not sure if it's this clip or the other one, but it finishes with my son uh, that was, uh, he's four years old that, that waited very nicely all during the time that I was filming myself. For him, apparently, it looked normal, what I was doing. He, I finished, and then he told me, Abba, I have pee and caca. <laughs> so, so that's, how the, yeah, that's, how the clip, that's how the clip finishes. 
<laughs> so for anyone who wants to find that on YouTube, you know, go, go look for that. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I assume that was your first time um, conducting virtually. Um, that was actually the second time, but but I never did it before before Corona. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So ha have you seen other conductors um, in Israel or in other countries, you know, trying to find ways to work with artists and, and collaborate musically, um, you know, virtually this past year and, and succeed in doing so and creating new music as a result of that? Well, succeed is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, term because the, what are the, what, how do we define success in this kind of, of times? But obviously, I think well, I know many, not only conductors, but... I, I think all, let's say it that way, in, my, in, in the way I see it, a, a cultural institution cannot be stagnated. Either you move forward or you move backwards, but you cannot just stay in your place. And that's why during this pandemic and during this time that we couldn't do what we do on a daily basis, I think that like I felt uh, and many other places felt, we must do something. We must continue uh, 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 creating and spreading and and even you know to be less politically correct try to make a living out of it because <laughs> because we need to understand how this new world is going to be and I'm, I I want to say it, it was in many ways also a very good experience uh, uh, I mean for me on the personal level because uh, some truths that should have been very clear for me, or maybe were, but but I did not grasp them to their fullest, suddenly uh, 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 were, were standing in front of me there so clear and so beautiful. Like, for example, the fact that when you move to the uh, digital realm, you know, if you look at other orchestras in Israel that usually we are like in, I don't want to say competition, but we are in kind of a, a, a continuous uh, a, a, a effort to try and gain more audiences and have more concerts and, and do bigger stuff. Suddenly I understand that, you know, if you look at the Israeli Philharmonic, my very good friend Lahav Shani and their amazing work, when they go to the digital realm, they need to face the Philharmonic of Berlin or the Philharmonic Orchestra of Los Angeles. While when we go into the digital realm, we are uh, shining in our uniqueness, in our singularity, um, which was amazing for me to see. And it was amazing for me to see how big talking about this agenda of, of a cultural mix, uh, to see how much our uh, uh, message is getting across and how much what we do is appreciated. You know that our YouTube channel during Corona year, uh, we had an average of 3 million, to be completely honest, 2.8 million views on our, uh, on our YouTube channel per month when Israel was only on the fourth place of this with 12% of the of the watchers. We had 30% coming from Morocco watching wow. this orchestra, 16% from Turkey, a country that we, up to the corona, we did not have any, any with Morocco, we had kind of relations, you've seen Sana, you've seen, but Turkey is something that we just started uh, uh, one year before the corona. Algeria, Algeria, this closed country that, that has no diplomatic or whatsoever relations with Israel with 14% in the third place, only then Israel and the following uh, countries. So, so all of these uh, truths that we have experienced because we had to work like this are something that will follow us and will guide us in many ways in the continuation of our work in the coming years, both in the real, in real life performances and on the digital realm. Wonderful. So let's let's go. I know people want, want more music. So let's go to the third song um, called Bedouin Love Song. Do you want to introduce it? A song that um, a, a singer that many of, of our, I'm sure that many of your uh, viewers slash listen, listeners love very much. Uh, the Israeli, Spanish, uh, uh, American uh, troubadour David Broza, which one of his most loved songs called the uh, Bedouin Love Song. And basically what I did in this song is I took the song as it is and I mashed it up with a famous uh, composition by Muhammad Abdel Wahab, considered to be Bach of Egyptian music of, of last century. Uh, the piece is called Aziza, and, and I, I won't talk too long about it, but just 
I think it's very obvious to see how these two work together. Wonderful.
I, I don't know about everyone else, but I, I want to get up and dance, but I'm not allowed to when I moderate. So <laughs> maybe I'll listen to some more later. But um, Matthew, let's let's go to you. Um, I know that you had some technical comments and, and questions for Tom about this, this style of blended music. Yeah, to preface it a little bit, to go back to how we have so much Africa in the U.S., the reason Brazilian music became so such a big influence in the U.S. and it literally influenced everything that's happening along with Afro-Cuban music is that in the late 50s in Brazil, Tom Jobim, Antonio Carlos Jobim and Jorge Gilberto figured out how to take the ethnic percussion instruments that made up the batucada or samba and transport it over to the North American rhythm section. So piano, bass, guitar, and drums. So they had all these ethnic percussion instruments and cavaquinho and vocals. And there was no way that North Americans could play that until they transferred that to the North American rhythm section. And the same thing happened with Afro-Cuban music with Dizzy Gillespie and the jazz influence on late forties. They figured out how to take authentic Afro-Cuban rhythms and play them with the North American rhythm section. So that presents some challenges. And I see what Tom is doing is this is a very similar thing. If you noticed in that clip, there was a drum set player that was really killing it. <laughs> and it was really wonderful. He's a great player. So this is a little bit of a technical question, but um, it's what successfully allowed Brazilian and Afro-Cuban music to flourish in, the, in North America. And so my question to Tom is, how do your how does the traditional elements of the music that you're dealing with which is based on hand percussion and how do we how do you translate that to a tr a more contemporary north american rhythm section which includes electric bass which you know the music didn't have and this is the same thing with brazilian music they didn't have electric bass but they made it work to transfer that those ethnic per hand percussion parts to the drum set so that's the first part of the question. The second part is how do you deal with it sonically because the drums make so much noise on stage that it's one of the reasons the hand percussions work so well is because they're not loud. So um, those are my technical questions, Tom. So first of all, thank you very much. I must say your question made me very optimistic because I cannot imagine today thinking about the Brazilian show, for example, without the, the bass line uh, so so I so I I'm, I feel optimistic about the process that we are doing. Uh, I must say you, uh, as as expected of you, you touched a very you touched a very crucial point in transmitting uh, this music in, and and giving it a, a new life or new outfit without without cancelling what made it beautiful to begin with. And uh, the idea is actually that there are two options to deal with it, Re referring to the, to the drums now. I, I, won't, I speak less about the bass because the bass really has to do with a whole different aspect of how we harmonize this music that originally was uh, played in unison. Uh, it's music that in most places, uh, uh, harmony was replaced by heterophony, meaning everybody playing the same melody, only a bit nuanced differently. Uh, so we leave the bass on the side, but talking about the drums is something that people can grasp easier. Basically, we have two options, two routes that we have to take at any moment. The first one is uh, is to try and, and really 
translate the rhythm into, uh, into the drum set. Uh, this is work that is mainly continuous, this drum player that, that you mentioned. Uh, it has been playing, he's a very young boy, uh, a very young man, sorry. Uh, I can't help myself to treat them as a father sometimes, uh, talking about Mother's Day. Um, and and uh, he's been with us for the last three and a half years. And the reason that I got him is because it is somebody young, super talented, but young and fresh. And I knew that he's keen to learn and listen and open and, and develop this style because he's constantly evolving and constantly listening to music, understanding its aesthetics, understanding its meaning, and also looking at other players in the world that are already doing this transition, which can be amazing jazz artists or that come from North Africa, like Karim Ziad, for example, uh, who, I, who I got uh, the, lucky enough to work with uh, uh, in Europe more than once, uh, and in Morocco, and, and uh, or, or actually looking at musicians at weddings or, or, uh, or uh, uh, you know, less formal uh, assemblies uh, where the drum set is also became a part of the, so you have a whole technique which sometimes you want to use, sometimes you want to avoid, but you need to be aware of. So this is one approach. Uh, uh, the other one is, is trying to play with this because we do have a percussionist on stage also trying to create this kind of two layered dialogue, constant dialogue between the percussion and the drum set. So if we look at Wayak that we held in the, uh, in the verses, uh, both of them play the, the rhythm. They, they just played together with the same emphasis. With the, but during the chorus, when we wanted to create this more heavy kind of, uh, 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 let's say, let's call it poppy mainstream feel, while the drums are, while the percussions are still playing this, the drums are playing half time, what, what we would call half time, which actually give it this feel that is a lot easier that, that if, let's call it a Western ear, listens to it, it finds it very communicative. It's a lot easier to understand where is the one, where is the song going to, what is the vibe, but the, but the Eastern ear that will listen to the same thing will not feel that we gave up its authenticity or that we played with the rhythm or that we did something because they worked perfectly together. They communicate very well between them. So yeah, and so the drummer is playing what we would call the backbeat. Yeah. Halftime feel. So the backbeat, I think if, if, if you think about the contribution of Afro, Afro music to the United States and what it gave us was the backbeat, because we hear the backbeat in funk and pop and in jazz and in so many styles. So you're bringing that African element of the backbeat and layering on top of it. Exactly. The Eastern. Yeah. Exactly. Great. That's, and and, and uh, again, thank you for that question. <laughs> the, but but uh, there, was, there was a second uh, uh, part of the question. Please remind me. Yeah, how, how do you deal? I've had the, this struggle oftentimes when we have um, folkloric instruments such as the kanun and the ne and these instruments playing and you have a drum set player. The drums are just so loud. Um, yeah. How do you deal well, with that? To be honest, uh, first of all, it is a big challenge that we are constantly dealing with. Uh, as we become bigger and, and more resourceful, we can allow ourselves to invest in a bigger room to rehearse at and more pexi glasses surrounding the, the drummer in small amplification also during the rehearsal so people can hear themselves. But it's, to be honest, it's a continuous struggle. Sometimes you get to a stage, it is not all the stages are the Israeli opera that we've seen in this uh, concert. Sometimes the stage is a bit smaller uh, and, and the, the horns just don't want to sit that close to the, to the not, not to mention the, the, the instruments that you mentioned that are amplified well. The, the whole orchestra basically is amplified because we cannot really create a, a, a natural balance between an instrument like the oud and the, and the drum set. But by amplification, we create this thing. Now our main job is to still be able to play as an ensemble. Not to say, okay, that's solved for the PA, that's solved for the audience. Now just, just uh, bite your tongue and do whatever is needed. No, no, no. We need, one of the reasons, again, bringing a young man into the thing is that can, everybody can boss him around. 
it's not, <laughs> it's not that <laughs> it's not this drummer that you imagine that I am that I'm sure he will become one day you know I, I just had a, a project with the with the the Dutch Metropole orchestra a very known orchestra one of your Grammys and And you come there and basically it's an 80 piece orchestra, but the drummer sits in the middle. He's been there for the last 12 years. Nobody, not the conductor and not any violinist will tell him how to play his grooves and how to play his thing because he's the boss of the orchestra. Having a young a man that is learning through the orchestra within the orchestra helps also this aspect. Yeah. If I could say one thing that we've kind of come on in the Mediterranean Music Institute and some of the things we do, uh, working with the concept of like the Akaseka Trio, which is this wonderful Argentinian trio, we often have a drummer that plays a hybrid set where he might have a high, a high hat and a very small snare drum and a cymbal, but he's sitting on a cajon. Mm -hmm. And he has a pedal, like a bass drum pedal. So essentially, he's made a hybrid drum set of hand percussion instruments, which is much quieter. So we've been struggling with that as well. And you don't always have the budget to have this, the plexiglass screens and the big sound system. But at any rate, I think the, the recording sounds wonderful. That we Thank just you very much. We actually started from there. We started from the hybrid uh, uh, percussion set and, and later moved on into the set because we just felt that We are, we are walking around something that we, around the sound that we are really looking for at the end of the day. Yeah, and the real, the, the North American, if you will, drum set is what gives it the portability that will allow it to spread throughout the world. Because everybody has a drum set with a kick drum, a snare drum, a hi-hat, and a couple exactly. of tom-toms. But not everybody has a hybrid set. Exactly. So we have um, two more clips to show you that I want to make sure we can get in um, for this hour. We're getting a lot of requests coming in from the chat. So the next song is called Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Boy Ligani. And Tom, nice. I said it right? Good. I liked uh, it, yeah. <laughs> Tom, why don't you explain what, what this song is about? Well, that's, that's a liturgical song, a, a piyut originally, that is actually, it's the next level of what, what we are doing and what, what we've been talking about. An amazing pianist, a very good friend of mine, but really the only musician in the world that I can full-heartedly say this man is a genius, uh, Omri Mor, playing uh, uh, his, uh, the way he conceives this piyut, playing it in a different rhythm, in a 7-8 rhythm, playing with it, giving it jazz harmonies. And this basically is a wrap-up of everything Matthew and I just discussed in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, it's uh, in a concert in the Israeli opera, so the stage is big enough for the drums to play as loud as they want.
<laughs> thank you. I, I must I must just say that I made a horrible mistake. I feel so ashamed for it. it I, I introduced the wrong clip completely. Uh, same concert, different clip. Uh, that was the encore of, of that concert, the, the, the last piece we played. Uh, uh, the whole concert was with three amazing pianists. Uh, uh, the other two are younger than Omri, but are next generation. And really, each one of them is a whole world of music, knowledge, and, and virtuosity. Uh, Guy Mintus and Nizar El Khater, you've seen there me and uh, Nizar playing uh, a dialogue between each other. I urge you to go on YouTube and watch the full video where Omri and the uh, guy go at it at the second vamp. We Sorry. will, we definitely, we definitely will. And some questions coming in, just if you could point to, because someone commented that it feels like very Eastern music to them with the Arabic and the, and the style of music. What, what's, what are the Eastern elements and what are the Western elements? And, and do you see this kind of music um, proliferating more both in your region and, and in the United States, like Matthew said, and, and around the world? Well, first of all, I, I have two things to say. It's true that we, we chose, we had to choose like the spe very specific uh, pieces, but as we do uh, uh, East in a Western way, which I will shortly explain how, we also do the opposite, meaning you can also find, again, I urge you to go both on our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube accounts of the orchestra, uh, or, our, or our official website, you can uh, find uh, um, the, a, a concert, for example, of French chanson rearranged in a North African way. So the idea is always to take something from one side and bring it to the middle in a way. In this particular piece, for example, a song by uh, uh, Iraqi composer Munir Bashir, uh, Iraqi composer and old player Munir Bashir, uh, that is called Um Saad, for, the, for, for actually Um Saad meaning mother of Saad, which is why eventually we chose this video and not the one that I was thinking that I spoke about. Uh, but uh, uh, Um Saad, his wife, the mother of his son, uh, and this piece, we took it and basically rearranged it. It's harmonized completely. Originally, this piece is played by an oud and a percussion uh, instrument, and that's it. It's very impressive, it's very cool, it's very chromatically sounding, but nobody ever had to deal with how you harmonize these chromatic vibes. And, and uh, together with the Omri originally, and then obviously with other uh, great pianists on stage, we did that. So or the whole drum set, the whole strings playing this kind of strings and horns playing this kind of uh, Broadway-esque kind of, of, of uh, arrangement to the very Arabic melody is exactly the core of what we want and aspire to do. Wonderful. And maybe one last question before the last clip is, you know, do you see this type of music growing um, in popularity and recognition in the United States and around the world? And, and how do you hope to influence perhaps other musicians. Um, you mentioned the younger generation, um, you know, that you have a father figure, you know, feeling towards, do you hope yeah. to um, bring this music, you know, out more into the world? My personal goal in life as, a, as an individual, as an, 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 as a, a, an institution, as somebody standing in the head of an institution, is really to bring this new musical language to the front as much as possible. If I'm successful, it means that in 20 years from now, this genre of music, and we can call it East-West now, but hopefully they will find another name with the years, uh, will, will have its own Wikipedia uh, 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 explanation and will, and will be studied in universities where you don't have to choose if you want to go left or right, where you can choose to learn both and, and, and create something out of it together. I just told Matthew on the phone a few days ago when we spoke, my dream is that one day a young girl will come up. She can be Israeli, she can be Moroccan, she can be Iranian or Russian. She will do exactly what I'm doing, only so much better and more creative. I would be the iPhone 3 and she would be the iPhone 12. And I would be happy to say, great, this musical style now got bigger than what I dreamt of. And now I need to sit back and just watch the kids create it, uh, to, like take it to the next levels. So I see that happening through institutions like uh, Matthew's Heading. I see it happening a lot uh, with, with places that I get to and, and partners that I have around the world. And I don't see any other option but this style becoming more and more 
something that you can't ignore and that affects positively both the musical scene, but also trying to keep it modest, the political situation as much as possible. Well, at, at only 38 years old, I'm sure that you'll bring us a lot more music for, for many decades to come. Um, I personally would love to see you live. It's, it's, it's been wonderful to share this music. I know we're getting questions from, from our audience from around the world. When can they see you live? How do they find you? How do they download your music? Again, we'll it's be sharing. It's a question from Bruni. It's a question from Bruni to bring it to, to, bring it to New York. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, please, as Tom said, find him on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, go to his website. And again, we will be sharing this clip for all who um, want it after, after the webinar ends today. Um, thank you so much, Tom, Matthew, and Booney for your time and for sharing this beautiful music for Mother's Day. Um, please stay on. We will show one last parting clip as a Mother's Day gift to all of you mothers out there. Um, and please join us um, this coming Wednesday at noon Eastern. As always, we will be having our next webinar um, called From Silicon Valley to Silicon Wadi. Um, speaking of um, the confluence of uh, um, different groups in the region, uh, where we'll be talking about high tech innovation globally and the influence of American high tech institutions that have come um, to Israel and to the region. So thank you everyone for joining um, and we hope to see you on Wednesday. Please share this webinar with your friends and family. Thank you to our panelists. And we will have one um, parting clip, like I said, um, right now, which is called the Ladino Love Song.
Ancador 